Hello. Uh, it's your fave, Nick Stone, here to present a very special first chapter Friday because it's for a book that is not out yet and does not come out until this fall. Let's jump on into it. I know the makeup is like mad extra today, but I was trying to match. How did I do? Mm hmm. All right, so Dear Justice, this is my upcoming novel. All right. Dear Justice, part one, the end. Snapshot, two boys on a brand new playground, 2010. It didn't take much for Quan to decide he was leaving this time. He feels a little bit bad, yeah. Knowing Deja and Gabe are still in the house makes his stomach hurt the way it always does when he finds himself faced with grown people problems he can't fix. But Quan's only nine. Running away alone will be hard enough. Trying to bring a four-year-old sister and a two-year-old brother just isn't going to work. He's glad spring has sprung early. Didn't have time to grab a jacket as he fled. He's pretty sure there was too much commotion for anybody to notice, but he takes a few unnecessary turns en route to his destination in case Olaf, that's what Quan calls his mama's duck-ass boyfriend, which is what Quan's dad calls the guy, did notice Quan's exit. What Quan is sure of? He couldn't stay there. Not with dude yelling and throwing things the way he was. Quan knows what comes next, and he couldn't watch again. It was hard enough seeing the aftermath bloom in the funny-looking bluey-purple blotches that made Mama's arms and legs look like somebody had tossed water balloons full of paint all over her. He couldn't really do anything anyway. Though Olaf, Dwight's the guy's actual name, isn't too, too big, he's a whole heck of a lot stronger than Quan. The one time Quan did try to intervene, he wound up with his own funky colored blotch across his lower back from where he hit the dining room table when dude literally threw Quan across the room. Hiding that bruise from daddy was nearly impossible and Quan had to hide it because he knew if daddy found out what really happened when Olaf slash Dwight came around, well, it wouldn't be good. So he made sure Deja and Gabe were safe in the closet. That was the most he could do. As Wynwood Heights Park looms up on the left, Quan lifts the hem of his shirt to wipe his face. It's the fourth time he's done it, so there's a wet spot now. He wonders if there will be any dry spots left by the time he gets the tears to stop. Good thing there's no one around to see. He'd never hear the end of it. He bounces his toes as his feet touch down on the springy stuff the new playground is built on. There's a sign that says it's ground up old tires, that the play structures are made from recycled water bottles and other discarded plastics, and that the entire area is green. But as Deja pointed out the last time Mama brought them all here, whoever built the thing didn't know their colors because everything is red, yellow, and blue. The thought of his sass-mouthed little sister brings fresh tears to Quan's eyes. He makes a beeline for the rocket ship. It sits off in a corner separate from everything else, tip pointed at the sky like it could blast off at any moment. Inside the cylindrical base, there are buttons to push and dials to turn and a ladder that leads up to an observation deck with a little window. It's Quan's favorite spot in the world, though he'd never admit that to anyone. When he gets inside, he's so relieved he collapses against the rounded wall and lets his body slide to the floor like chocolate ice cream down the side of a cone on a hot summer day. His head drops back and he shuts his eyes and lets the tears flow freely. But then there's a sound above him, a cough. The moonlight through the deck window makes the face of the boy staring down at Quan look kind of ghostly. In fact, the longer dude stares without speaking, the more Quan wonders if maybe he is a ghost. Uh, hello? Dude doesn't reply. Now Quan is starting to get creeped out, which makes him mad. This is supposed to be the one place in the world where he can relax, where he's not looking over his shoulder or being extra cautious, where he can close his eyes and count down from 10 and imagine shooting off into space, far, far away from everything and everyone. Yo, why you looking at me like that, Quan spits, each word sharp-tipped and laced with the venom of his rage. Oh, um, the other boy's eyes drop to his hands. He picks at the skin around his thumbs, something Quan does sometimes that gets him yelled at. Hmm. The boy goes on. I'm sorry, I just wasn't expecting anybody else to come in here. Oh, the boys are quiet for a minute and then, I'm Justice, by the way. Justice. Quan's heard that name before. You that smart kid they was talking about on the morning announcements at school? Won some contest or something? Justice, again, doesn't reply. 
Hello, Quan says. You gonna make fun of me now? Huh? Now Justice looks out the observation window. Quan wonders what he's seeing. I wish they would have never made that announcement. Winning an academic bowl isn't cool. Everybody just makes fun of me. Quan shrugs. Maybe they just jealous because they never won nothing. Silence falls over the boys again, but this time it's not so uncomfortable. In fact, the longer Quan sits there with Justice above him, the better he feels. Kinda nice not being totally alone, which makes him wonder. You're a fifth grader, right? You're not gonna get in trouble for being out this late? Oh, I will, Justice says. It makes Quan laugh. I snuck out, Justice continues, but it's not the first time and I'm sure it won't be the last. I think my mama knows I'll always come back. Wish I didn't have to go back. It slips out and at first Quan regrets it, but then he realizes his chest is a little looser. This one time at daddy's house, Quan watched a movie about this big ship that hit an iceberg and sunk. And there was this one scene where the main lady was being tied into this thing that went around her stomach and laced up the back like a sneaker. He later learned it was called a corset, but that's what comes into Quan's head when he thinks about his life. My mom's boyfriend is an asshole, he continues. The laces loosen a little more. He's my little brother and sister's dad, so like, I kind of get why my mom keeps dealing with him. A little looser. But I hate him. Every time he come around, he mad about something and he takes it out on my mom. Sounds familiar, Justice says. And I'd be wanting to stick around for my brother and sister, but wait. Quan looks up at Justice, whose chin is now propped in his hand. All eyes and ears on Quan. What'd you say? Quan asks. Hmm? Just a second ago. Oh, I said that sounds familiar. What you mean? Justice sighs. My dad was in the military and went to Afghanistan. Ever since he came back, he's been different. He drinks a lot and sometimes has these episodes, my mom calls them. Out of nowhere, he'll start yelling and throwing stuff. Now Justice isn't looking at Quan anymore. He hits her sometimes. Justice swipes at his eyes. Quan stands up. You ever come here during the day? Occasionally, just sniffles. Sorry for crying. Man, whatever. Now I see how you won that academic thingy. Huh? What kind of fifth grader says occasionally? Quan shakes his head. I'm gonna head home and check on my brother and sister, he says. You should go check on your mom. The boys meet eyes and understanding passes between them. I'll see you around. Quan ducks and slips through the rocket's arched entryway. He's almost back at the edge of the rubber floored playground when, hey, hold up. Quan turns around to find Justice is headed in his direction. You didn't tell me your name, Justice says out of breath. Quan smiles. Vernell Laquan Banks Jr. and lifts his hand. Call me Quan. It was real nice to meet you, Quan, Justice says, smacking his palm against Quan's and then hooking fingers. Even, uh, despite the circumstances? Now Quan laughs. You're 10 years old, man. Loosen up. Sorry. Don't be. Quan shoves his fists into his pockets. It's gotten cooler. Nice to meet you too, Justice. And Quan turns on the heel of his well-worn Jordans and heads home. So this book is a, I call it a sequanion because it's like a sequel because it happens like right after Dear Martin, but it's also kind of a companion because it's from the perspective of a different character. Um, I don't think you need to read Dear Martin or need to have read Dear Martin to read this, but I do want to give, since it's not out yet, a little bit of background um, as to why I wrote it. So what I'm just going to do here is read the letter in the front of this advanced reader copy because I think it'll give some insight. Dear reader, I didn't really intend to write this book. Sound familiar? It should. I said the exact same thing in the opening letter of Dear Martin. It's as true now as it was then, though my reasoning's a little different. When I closed the back cover of that story, I told myself I was done with Justice McAllister and the world he inhabited. He'd reached a place of relative peace and come to a deeper understanding of his role as the captain of his own life ship. I felt good, as a book mom, about setting him free to decide where he was headed next and how he'd get there. But then came the day I received a set of text messages from a pair of boys I'd met because of Dear Martin and grown to respect and admire. It went like this, literally. And like, it's, this conversation is in the arc and it'll also be in the book. So like, you guys will have access to this. Um, D, hey guys, Z, what's up? <laughs> Me, favorites. D, I've been thinking, maybe, just maybe, you should make a book about us, Z. Yes. D. 
like black kids, you know? Not like Justice, because Justice had hope. He went to a good college. Me? Tell me more. D. We don't go to good colleges. We don't have a perfect family like everybody else. Z. That's facts. D. Honestly, we don't even know if we'll live past the age of 18. Ugh. Z. This stuff me and D go through every day. D. You probably can't put it all in a book, but man. Z. And we got family and friends locked up in everything. D. I know people will listen. You're our voice. <sighs> Since that conversation, I've had the privilege of meeting many boys and girls who are very much not like Justice, who aren't high achieving and headed toward blindingly bright futures, who don't nail their SATs or win state debate championships. I've met them not at preparatory academies or Ivy League universities, but in alternative schools and juvenile detention centers, which made me realize that while Justice's story might have come to a satisfactory conclusion, for me at least, there was someone else, a different character, whose story had not, Vernell Laquan Banks Jr. If you don't remember him from Dear Martin or haven't read it, don't worry, you will. He has a story to tell you. So, yeah, this is the hardest book I've ever written. And um, I guess at the core, the point is, I just want people to notice other people, to recognize when other people are struggling. Cause like we all are fighting some kind of battle and I'm not gonna like go on and on. Um, Cause I want y'all to pick this up and get it and read it. So yeah, this is Dear Justice. Hope you dig it.